Now, the treatment of women in the military is often in the headlines for all the wrong reasons, and the problem is not confined to the Australian Defence Force. Rabia Sadiq was a senior military lawyer who worked for the British Army during the Iraq War. She successfully sued the British Army for discrimination and has now written about her experience, and it's a great delight to have her with us in the studio. Rabia, thank you very much. Your story, we could spend an hour on this couch, I have to tell everybody, but it is a remarkable story, but we need to show shorthanded for uh, obviously for time purposes sure. but you were born in Australia in Perth that's right yes. trained as a lawyer yes and then you decided you wanted to go overseas and ended up working for the British Army that's right yes so first generation Australian my father's an Indian Muslim trained in law and in 1998 I left Australia because I had a dream to become an international humanitarian lawyer Joining the army was not part of the plan. That was an accident, um, a happy accident. Um, and I commissioned into the British Army as a legal officer in 2001, literally uh, just before September 11. And then shortly after, you found yourself being sent off to literally the war zone. That's right. So 2001, I commissioned. 2005, I was selected as the first female legal advisor to deploy to Iraq. Now you got yourself caught up there in an extraordinary situation. Two SAS officers had been taken, had been kidnapped, mm. and then you and a fellow officer, a male officer, were sent to try and negotiate their release. Mm, that's right. You yourself then became a hostage yes. in the same situation. That's right. Well, up until that point, um, I did things differently to my colleagues. I think because of my Muslim background. Um, I knew very much that I was in there as an uninvited guest in Iraq, as it were. So I wore a hijab every time uh, that I dealt with my Iraqi colleagues. I spoke a little bit of Arabic to break the ice and just showed them some respect. And I guess it was because of that different approach that I developed trusting relationships with them quite quickly. So when that fateful day came and the two SAS soldiers uh, that were my colleagues, uh, we heard that they had been illegally kidnapped and detained. An Iraqi judge was sent in to investigate and the only one that he would negotiate with was me. So there I was, a mere military lawyer, not trained as a hostage negotiator, not trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, but I was the, their only hope, if you like. Um, so I was sent in to negotiate their release. And that was successful for a while, just as the judge and I had agreed a set of conditions upon which he was happy to release them to me. All hell broke loose and a crowd of about 500 outside the police compound where we were negotiating, where the men were being held, had stormed the compound. They had set soldiers and tanks on fire. There was rocket propelled grenades. And in that instant, the judge and I lost control. The judge um, ran away for fear of his life. And my colleague who'd been sent in to help me uh, and myself were then uh, held as hostages and mm. thrown into a cell. Mm. You talked of a moment where you, in fact, a, and then a rogue gunman arrived on the scene as well. You had a gun pointed at you. Mm. And I'm interested in this particular point because I think it goes on to define what you did later, was you stared at him mm. and you just defined that word of defiance mm. that you hadn't recognised in yourself completely until that point. No. It was part of your nature. Yes, I think I, at that moment I surprised myself because when this man came rushing in uh, and saw James, my colleague, and I, raised his AK-47 rifle, cocked it and pointed it to my head, my immediate reaction, my instinctive reaction, if you like, was just to stare at him, stare at his eyes, almost challenging him that if you're going to shoot me, you're going to have to look me in the eyes and murder me. And as I said, I sort of shocked myself, really, that I had this defiance and this inner, inner strength. Now, I'm going to fast forward again because J James, your colleague, and yourself, James Woodham, you returned back to England, having successfully ended this. He gets a military cross, you get nothing. Mm, that's How right. did that make you feel, given you were so much part of the negotiations? Look, I had no feelings of ill will against James. I was genuinely happy for him. But what really hurt um, me and angered me eventually was the fact that not only was James awarded a military cross for outstanding bravery, but my role, the key role that I played in the incident, wasn't acknowledged, wasn't recognised and wasn't even reflected in my confidential staff report, which would never have made it out of the army. But they weren't even willing to do that, which is all I actually sought. Mm. So you decided, after much deliberation and thought, that you would take them 
to court on the yes. grounds of sexual discrimination, sexual and racial, being a Muslim and a woman. Yes, that's right. That decision took about two years. I exhausted every other informal avenue for resolution before I was forced to take that decision, which wasn't a decision I wanted to take because it would have meant the end of my military career. But yes, eventually I mounted a discrimination action against the government and the armed forces. And uh, you, you said, and, and it's very particularly interesting to me because we've had a, a big debate in this country about our first female Prime Minister mm. and she talked about being silent. If you're a woman, if you speak up, you are accused of playing the gender card. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you remain a victim. Mm. You made that choice not to be a victim even though there were going to be consequences for you. Yes. Why I make that decision? Yeah, I didn't see it um, as a decision that I had any choice in really because the irony was when I came back from Iraq I was posted to a role where every day I was responsible for training soldiers and officers including Prince William uh, on equality and diversity I played a key role in trying to ensure that the British Army brought themselves into the 21st century and became a more equal and a more diverse force so what sort of a hypocrite would I have been if I was training these soldiers about stamping out discrimination in the forces, if I wasn't prepared to stand up for the discrimination that I was suffering? And I'm very much a do-as-I-say and as-I-do person. In the end, you settled, though, so mm -hmm. you didn't win your day in court, you settled. Do you, do you feel then that you got your voice? Absolutely, because mm. what happened was... Uh, in the lead up to the court case, the army tried every trick in the book to intimidate me and one of those things was to leak my story to the media. And all that did was spark up the world's interest. Uh, and uh, on my day in court, um, the world's media were there. So what it did was shine the light on my landmark case. But I did decide to settle because at that point in time, um, I was pregnant with triplets. So there were bigger issues at stake. <laughs> it wasn't just about me and my mission yeah, and my longer. cause. You know, I had, to, I had to think about the little lives inside of me that were very precious. Rabia, yeah. just an amazing story. Uh, some would say Thank you're you. an underachiever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you and good luck for the future. Thank you for having me.